Well, good morning, Shiloh. Good morning. This weekend is perhaps one of the most holy weekends in the life of the church. It's the weekend in which we celebrate the lives of those who have gone on before us, who have finished the race, who have fought the good fight, and who are now eating that, at that heavenly dinner table with Jesus Christ. For thousands of years, men and women have said yes to Jesus. They have used their passion and their gifts. They have sacrificed their lives. They have left a legacy all for the sake of the movement of the kingdom of God. And even us, even we here at Shiloh have this history that echoes back 2,000 years when a group of ordinary people decided to start a class meeting, a Bible study, and dream of the possibilities of God planning a church right here, a Methodist church right here in Delhi. And those dreams turned into a purchase of land, and that purchase of land turned into a little white church that still sits on our property today. Certainly, church, we have a long legacy of faith. Men and women and children who have prayed, who have sacrificed, who have given their all so that we could have what we have, so we could sit in this place and worship God in the way that we're worshiping God. And on this All Saints Weekend, we remember. We remember their faithfulness. We remember their courage. We remember their dedication both our spiritual mothers and fathers in the faith, but also we remember our family and our friends who have fought that good fight, who have finished their race, and who challenge us, who challenge us to look deep within ourselves and ask ourselves the question, what legacy, what faith-filled legacy will we leave? long after our lives have ended. This morning, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles or pull out your sermon notes and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is found in the New Testament. And if you have a Bible from the gathering space, it's on page 843. If you don't have a Bible, go to the gathering space, take one of those Bibles, write your name in it. It's yours. All that we ask you to do is to come back and to worship and bring that Bible with you. We want you to have the word of God for your daily life. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and 20 through 23. Listen to what the Bible says. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for, by faith. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, when when Jacob was dying, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And if we continue in Hebrews chapter 11, there's story after story after story of superstar in the faith, leaving a legacy for you and for me and for the whole world. And I want to encourage you to go home and read the entirety of Hebrews chapter 11. It's one of the most inspiring and most challenging books in the entire Bible. I mean, these men and women are the grandmas and the grandpas of our faith, and they have left us a legacy that has lasted for thousands upon thousands of years. But here's the problem. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, we can look at the lives of these superstars in the Bible, and we can think to ourselves, well, I'm never going to be a Moses. I'm never going to be an Abraham. I'm never going to be a Jacob. And we can think to ourselves that these persons' lives are supposed to be some kind of spiritual measuring stick for our lives. But that wasn't the purpose of Hebrews chapter 11. No, Hebrews 11 was written as a word of encouragement, not only to the Christians of that day, 
but also a word of encouragement to us. How do I know? Well, the book of Hebrews was written during a time where Christians were being persecuted for their faith. This was prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and and during the reign of Roman Roman Emperor Nero. Now, Nero was known for his cruel and unusual torture of Christians. I mean, he was absolutely insane when it came to the treatment of people who followed Jesus Christ with their everyday lives. In fact, after an accidental fire in, in Rome, the city of Rome burned for six days. Nero had to blame someone, and so he decided to blame Christians, and this is what happened. Listen to this eyewitness account. In their very deaths, they were made subjects of sport, for they were covered with hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses or set to fire, and when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. Human torches. I mean, this is what Christians were experiencing where the writer of Hebrews was writing his book, where the writers of Hebrews was writing his words of encouragement. And so you can imagine that these Christians were full of depression, that these Christians were full of despair, that these Christians had all but lost hope. And the writer of Hebrews wanted to remind them that there were people that knew he wanted to remind them that there were people who cared. And so he went on to write, this is Hebrews eleven thirty six 36-38. He's talking about these Christians, and he says, Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed and two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins and destitute and persecuted and mistreated. And the world, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and living in caves and holes in the ground. Now, church, if that was your life, if that was your everyday life, don't you think you would be full of darkness and despair and you would have all but lost hope? And so, in order to give these Christians a little hope, in order to say to them, there is hope to endure, there is hope that God is still on your side, this author pens Hebrews chapter 11. Because they needed the hope. But they weren't the only ones who needed hope. I believe those of us right here today, we too need a little hope in our lives. It's amazing to me that there are people in this church that have experienced so many devastating things here lately. From the sudden death of family members that they absolutely loved, to just unbelievable health crisis, personal health crisis that people are facing, and not just a few people, but person after person. And when you experience that kind of stuff, this darkness and this despair, they overcome you, and it can leave you asking the question, where is God? Where's the hope in all of this? Well, I believe this morning that God wants to bring to us a word of encouragement, a word of hope. And not only does God want to bring us a word of encouragement, but God wants to teach us what it means to really genuinely live a faith-filled legacy. But first, we need to know what a legacy looks like. What does it mean to live a faith-filled legacy? I believe that each and every one of us as human beings have this spiritual desire in our hearts to live lives a meaning. We want to live meaningful lives, and not only lives that have meaning in our present. You know, meaning for our neighbors and our friends and our children and our grandchildren. But also to live lives that have meaning for the future. But so often when we think about living a life of legacy, when we think about leaving a legacy... We have these big pictures in our mind, these grandiose visions of what that should look like. Like founding an orphanage for AIDS orphans. Or leaving millions upon millions of dollars for cancer research. And we say to ourselves, that's what it means to leave a legacy. But honestly, that's not the kind of legacy that the Bible is talking about. I mean, that's an incredible legacy, but the Bible has a very different picture of what it means for us 
to leave a legacy. How do we know? Well, let's look at the lives of Abraham and Sarah. Now, many of us have heard of Abraham and Sarah. They're Bible superstars. In fact, we wouldn't be in this place if it wouldn't be for Abraham and Sarah, that the foremother and forefather of our faith, and not only our faith, but the faith of the Jews and the faith of Islam. I mean, these are Bible superstars. And so often, when we read about them in the Bible, we paint them with this more than saintly brush. But the truth is, they were ordinary people like you and like me. You know, God had made Sarah and Abraham a promise. God had promised to make out of them a nation, a people. There was just one problem. Abraham and Sarah, they had no children, and they were old, like in their 90s. And so Abraham and Sarah all but lost hope. I mean, they did some really crazy, ordinary, human being kinds of things. Like, they started not trusting God, and they started to try to take control of their own lives. And there were moments where Abraham and Sarah were downright cruel. In fact, Sarah, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they got so frustrated with God that they decided that they were going to do this on their own. And so Sarah decides to give Hagar, her servant, her slave, to Abraham. And Abraham has a child with Hagar. And Sarah gets so jealous, so jealous, that she throws Hagar into the wilderness to die. Now, does that sound like a superstar to you, right? I mean, these people are regular people. They have ordinary lives. They're like us. They get confused. And before long, they start not trusting the promises that God made in their lives. And yet, this is what the writer of Hebrews has to say. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8, 11, and 12. By faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place where he later received as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. God fulfilled God's promise. You know, it wasn't the job of Abraham and Sarah to make out of themselves a nation. No, that was God's job. All that God was asking Abraham and Sarah to do was to live by faith. Church, leaving a legacy is about living by faith. Now, you may not realize it, but over and over and over again in the book of Hebrews, and particularly in chapter 11, there is this phrase used, by faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Miriam. By faith, Moses. By faith, Rahab. And the list goes on and on and on and on. It is a beautiful litany of the hall of faith. And yet, as human beings, as product of the 21st century, you know, we focus so much on individuals and their personal contributions to this world. And so it's no wonder that when we see an Abraham or a Sarah or a Moses or even a Rahab, We take that person and we put them on a spiritual pedestal. And we say to ourselves, I'll never be that. I'll never be Moses. I'll never be Sarah. I'll never be Abraham. But the truth is, that's not who God is calling us to be. That's not the kind of legacy that God wants us to live. And it begs the question, by whose faith? By whose faith are Abraham and Sarah and Moses able to do these things? Is it Sarah's faith? Is it Abraham's faith? Do they have some kind of spiritual chromosome that makes them extra religious, extra faithful to God? Or is it God's faith? Is it God that has faith in Abraham? 
Is it God that has faith in Moses? Is it God that has faith in Sarah? Is it God's faith? Is it by the faith of God that these ordinary men and women are able to do extraordinary things, not because of who they are, but because of God's work and them? By God's faith, Abraham and Sarah bore a nation. By God's faith, Moses led God's people out of slavery in Egypt. And by God's faith, God chose the most ordinary and seemingly unlikely of characters. Like people like Rahab, who was a prostitute. And God used her to help God's people enter into his promised land. Now, if God can use Abraham and Rahab and Moses and Aaron and all of these faithful characters of the Bible, just imagine what God can do through you and through me. But so often, we dismiss our lives because we think we're not big enough. We think we're not extraordinary enough, and yet... That's not what it means to live a legacy. To live a legacy, to leave a legacy, is to live a life that's small, but with great love. That may sound familiar to you because often, when asked about her ministry in this world, Mother Teresa would would point to all the wonderful things that she was doing, and she would say, We human beings cannot do great things. We can only do small things with great love. And so church, what small things with great love is God challenging you, calling you to do? This week we traveled to the the home of a longtime member here, Sue Dome. And we asked Sue those very questions. What does it mean for you to leave a legacy? And this is what she had to say. The, uh, I think about, about the time the mines became unionized in 1940. My grandfather had bought this very small farm in Wayne County, and we came to live on this farm. It was rather a rude awakening, of course, I don't remember. It had no electricity. It had no plumbing. And... It took a little while, but we soon had uh, REA, and uh, we had uh, plumbing, of course, and it was a wonderful growing up, and I felt so secure because I had my grandfather, whom I call father, my grandmother, I called her mother, and my mother, Dorothy, was 19 years older, and I called her Dorothy. Now, she was really, she, she expected me to behave and treated me as mother and child, but yet so did my grandmother. So I really had two mothers. I had the best of everything. My grandmother made everything I wore. And my mother had a sister, Mary Sue. And Mary Sue and Dorothy were constantly saying, "Ah, mother didn't spend time with us like she does with Susie. She allowed me to cook. We cooked, we canned, we sewed, we did everything. And in the farm we had animals, and uh, we had a cow, we had our own milk, we had our own cream, our whipping cream. Uh, we had pigs, but that was always sad if someone had to be butchered. But we liked to eat, and we had chickens, and uh, it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful, it was, it was absolutely wonderful. I guess I was always loved, I was always wanted, I knew they did whatever they could do for me. I had the best. I think Sam Levinson wrote this in a book. He said, I was not rich, but I was rich because I knew that I was rich in family and I think that's what I had. And it was beautiful. I just wish every child today could have that. But you don't plan to be a legacy. A legacy really is how what other people think of you, how you influence people. Do people respect you enough to come to you and talk to you? Do they care enough to share their lives with you and, and understand and are, and are uh, interested when you share your interests and lives with them? 
and I always felt so grateful to people when anyone would be interested in Holly as she was growing up and ask me and give me advice to things that worked for them. Then too, now that Rupert's gone, I feel so good, even at the grocery store, if someone runs up to me and maybe I really don't know that, don't know them that well, but they'll run up, hi, how are you doing? Did you know that your husband married us? And just constantly being reminded that people remember. You know, it's amazing to hear over and over and over again. You know, it wasn't the big things. It wasn't those grandiose things in our lives that really help us to love one another. It was those small things, family and canning and serving together and cooking together and being with one another. Those were the things that Sue so often remembered and loved about her life. And so she shared those things with her children and grandchildren and continues to share those things with us. Church, what small thing with great love is God challenging you to do? Is God challenging you to spend more time serving your children or your grandchildren? Maybe God is asking you to step out of your comfort zone and and go and serve in Price Hill or, or New Orleans or even Nicaragua. Or maybe it's much more simple than that. Maybe God is asking you to go and visit that elderly widow on your street and just check up with them, you know, every single week. What is it? Is it to give a few extra dollars to the UMCOR offering or maybe even to greet Pat and Ken Cruder who are mourning the loss and celebrating the loss of their son this morning at the Cruder Memorial? What is it? What small thing with great love is God challenging you to do? You know, so often when we think about these Bible characters or we think about our own family members, we kind of put them on a pedestal. And we want to do that because we love them and we honor them and we admire them and they were wonderful and inspiring and great people, but they were just people. And their lives are meant to be a witness, a word of encouragement to those of us who are left here on this earth trying to figure this faith thing out. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We are surrounded by this incredible cloud of witnesses. And they are cheering us on. And they are encouraging us and they are challenging us with their lives and they're asking us, what legacy, what faith-filled legacy will you leave? What small thing with great love will you do? You know, Jesus majored in small things with great love. On the night in which he gave himself up for you and for me and for the whole world. He did something so simple. He nailed down at his disciples' feet and he washed every single one of their feet. A small thing done with incredible love. And then they shared a meal, the Passover meal, a meal that celebrates their forefathers and foremothers and the faith like Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And it was at that meal that Jesus showed us. He gave us the example of what real life, real love, really looks like. Jesus took something as ordinary as bread. He broke that bread. He gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And when that supper was nearly over, he took a cup. He gave thanks to God. He gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And so this morning we remember what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, and what Christ promises to do in the future.